Singularity. Hello everyone, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching another edition of Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. If you guys enjoy the show and want to help me make it better, uh, you can do so in one of two ways. You can simply go to iTunes and write a review for the show, or you can go to our donations page and make a donation. Today, my guest on the show is none other than Brian David Johnson. Uh, Brian David Johnson is a futurist at Intel Corporation. His charter is to develop an actionable vision for computing in 2020. His work is called Future Casting, using ethnographic field studies, technology research, trend data, and even science fiction to provide Intel with a pragmatic vision of consumers and computing. Along with reinventing, TV Johnson has pioneered development in artificial intelligence, robotics, and using science fiction as a design tool. He speaks and writes extensively about future technologies in articles and scientific papers, as well as science fiction stores, short stories and novels. Um, he has also directed two feature films and is an illustrator and commissioned painter. And actually, one of his masterpieces is right behind his back. So uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll have a couple of minutes to, to talk about uh, this painting and what it symbolizes. But first of all, let me say, Brian, I'm very happy to have you on the show. Oh, Nicola, it's a pleasure, pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to talking. Thank you so much. So let me jump in the interview with the first question. How in the world do you get to have the best job in the world? <laughs> I do feel very, very fortunate ab about my job. I mean, I, was, I came to Intel about 10 years ago. Um, and before that, I was doing interactive TV and sort of product development and looking about five to eight years out. And Intel was making a shift to a new form of computation, something, something called a system on chip or an SOC. And how you design an SOC is you need to understand the experience that you're going to bring to people. Um, and so they needed to come up with a way to start modeling that experience. So they ha brought me in to kind of bring the future casting work that I did to Intel and said, can you do it 10 to 15 years out? And then also, what if we gave you social science, social science data and also gave you access to people in the labs and you know, the amazing CTO of Intel, all these people. So that's, I was sort of doing the work, but I wasn't called Intel's futurist. I was called an experienced architect. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of dual background. I'm part principal engineer at Intel and then also a designer. So I was actually an experienced architect. I was architecting the experience. What's the hardware, the software, the services, all the stuff that goes in. Mm -hmm. And um, so how I actually got the job was um, I had just finished a book called Screen Future, which looked at the future of entertainment and, and computation. Um, and the CTO, Justin Ratner, came to me and said, we'd really like you to be Intel's futurist. Um, and I looked at him and said, no way. Are you kidding me? No way. And he was like, what do you mean? I'm like, do you have any idea the sort of the, the burden? I mean, being the futurist for Intel, it just it scared the, the heck out of me. Um, and so I said, no. And he said, oh, OK, fine. He's a very nice guy. He's like, oh, OK, fine. Go ahead. And then I went to New York City because this book was coming out. And it was really this book marked me kind of coming out of the labs because for many years inside of Intel, it was all secret. So it was all patents. I have about 25 patents and all that sort of stuff. But this is the first time I actually got to talk publicly and I had been sort of quiet for a while. And I was sitting down at the press interview and how you do these is every half an hour, a new journalist sort of sits down. And so everybody sat down and had the copy of, of the advanced copy of Screen Future and they'd read it. And everybody sat down and went, OK, so let's get this straight. I read the book. So you're Intel's futurist, right? And I was <laughs> like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm an experienced architect. And after the third person said, OK, let's see, you're pretty much Intel's futurist. I actually called Justin and said, OK, fine, I'll be Intel's futurist. And it's been great. It's been really amazing. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, it sounds amazing, but and, and the responsibility is there. So I, I, I actually have a separate specific question on that, but we're going to come back to that topic a little later. So let's let's just uh, clarify what else, what exactly do you do as the official Intel, Intel futurist? Well, I have two jobs, and they're very, very specific. So there's sort of my day job. In my day job, I work for a manufacturing company with engineers. So it is my job to look 10 to 15 years out, 
create these experience models. Basically, they're effects-based models for all of you sort of futurists and, and foresight people out there. So it's an, a, it's an effects-based planning model that says this is the effect that we want this technology to have on people. And basically, it's what will it feel like to be a human 10 to 15 years from now. I take those, and they're a mixture of social science, computer science, data science, sort of statistical data. And then I spend, I do a lot of interviews. I do hundreds of hours of interviews with people all over the world. I spend most of my time outside of the United States actually talking to people saying, this is where I think the future is going. Where do you think the future is going? So I will, and really want them to help me kind of craft it. And then I do a little bit of science fiction prototyping, using science fiction to based on science fact to get some of these visions in front of regular folks to say, what do you like and, and what do you don't like? Mm -hmm. And then that becomes this massive, amount of information. And then I work with very specifically the strategic designers and the silicon architects to design the platform, the capabilities of the platform. I'm working on 2019 today. So they literally create a, a document that's a specification called an experience specification. And it says this is what people will want to do with it based upon all of the things that we've learned. That then gets turned into a hardware requirements, the software requirements, the marketing requirements. And so really that's, that's job number one for me and, and why I have a, a team of future casters that do that. So, so let me get this right. So you basically kind of give them the vision of the final idea of the product or the vision and then they sort of reverse engineer the software and the hardware that it needs to have to be. So, Exactly. It's, it is, from, a, from an engineering standpoint, they love it because it's a requirements, right? If you're an engineer, you're there to solve a problem. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you go to somebody and say, we need to build this thing, then they'll say, okay, well, if that's the thing, okay, then I need to do this and then it needs to do this. If you can give them a vision for what the thing is that you want to build, yeah. then they're engineers. They can say, okay, so they actually see mm -hmm. that this experience requirements and sometimes even, even these science fiction stories so they can say, oh, okay, well, if, I, if you want that to happen, then I, as an engineer, my team need to do this, 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 and this. So we need to do those things. Bless you. All those things. <laughs> <laughs> so in that way, it's very much, it's a, it's a process, although it does sound very much like science fiction and all that, but it's very pragmatic. It is very much to say, I need to then have a spec that I can then go build to. And that's really, that's my background. So my background has always been, I'm a builder. It's mm -hmm. not, not sort of a, uh, one of these futurists that sort of makes the grand predictions or really comes out of academia. You know, I'm not a PhD. I very much have been a builder and building products for my entire career. And so that's why taking the future casting, the futurism work that I do, um, it's very specific. So tell us a little bit more about that difference between being a pragmatic sort of futurist and vers and versus those sort of less pragmatic or than even non-pragmatic ones. Well, and, and uh, let's be clear, we, the world needs both, right? I have nothing bad to say about sort of futurists who have broad views. I read all of their books. Please keep doing that, right? It's very, very important. But that's not really how I'm built. I mean, for me, the main difference is if I say we believe it will be like this 10 years from now and I get it wrong, I will not have a job. It's very specific, right? You, and then that's why I say it's pragmatic, right, is because if you are saying this is what we think it'll feel like and, and what this should be like, and you turn it into a spec, you fixed it. And it's infinitely trackable because, again, I work for an engineering company, so we have a process and we have to repeat the process, we have to validate the process, we have to make it better. So there's a rigorous level of accountability that I and my team are held to that that's the flavor of futurists that we have. And there's a lot of others. There's people in biotech that are doing that. Certainly in, in energy, people are doing that. Even in um, a lot of automotive, people are doing that as well. I think you have a generation of futurists who, because the, uh, the ability to actually come up with a vision for the future and then actually build it, has happening. It's something that 20 years ago wasn't there, whereas now the things that I, when I started coming, when I started working at Intel, the first work that I started to do, you can buy it now. You can actually go to Europe and buy those SOCs. They're actually out there, which is still makes me a bit dizzy that you can actually go and do that. But that's that kind of sort of pragmatic side of the, of the work that I do. And then, like I said, that's the day job. And then the other job is getting out there and talking to people about the future. And that's this Tomorrow Project and a lot of the public speaking I do 
is to, and really it's my passion, and it has been my passion for, for decades now, of, of getting people to think very differently about the future and talking to students and sort of changing it and really even changing how we build the future, um, I think is, is something that I do. So I spend a lot of time talking and then a lot of time writing about these sort of things. Again, I think it goes back to the pragmatic side of what I do is I write it down. Like a lot of the, mm -hmm. my, uh, my family members have come to me and said, so you have these grand visions for the future and sort of where things should be going, but then you write them down so people can actually like say, wait a minute, this thing that you said, it didn't happen or it yeah. did happen. So you have to be held accountable for it. And I actually find that very exciting. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, don't you ever, I mean, I know a lot of people are envious that you are Intel's futurist, but on, on the reverse side, don't you feel sometimes like, I wish I didn't write this. I, 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 I wish I've seen this b the way I see it now. I wish there wasn't like a record of this. <laughs> I wish I could be a little less pragmatic so that I don't get nailed on my mistakes. So I could be a little bit more fuzzy. I could say, ooh, don't look at this. No, actually, Nicola, um, I actually... I am more interested in what I get wrong than what we get right. One of the things that, that I, I often tell people um, is if you really want me to think that you like me, I want you to disagree with me, right? Because if we ever get everything right and we all agree with each other, it's a great tea party, but we don't really do anything, right? We, it's a great party and then maybe we can sit around and, and, and agree with each other, but you don't actually, that's not how you build things, right? You build things through friction and through different ideas and things like that. So when I get things wrong, very specifically, I sort of hold myself to it and go, well, why? I'll give you a great example. In the book, Screen Future, I think it's chapter number two or three. There's a, a section called Informative TV, mm -hmm. where I started looking at the effects of computer vision on television, on media. And when I say television, it's TV, movies, games, social networking, comic books, e-readers, sort of all the things that we are doing when we're not working, so yeah. sort of re relaxing. Yeah. I had seen it, and plus this was a work for looking out to 2015, so there's still time, but it is going slower where computer vision, actually having a computer watch TV or watch something else and having increased amount of information stream to us about what we're actually watching. Mm -hmm. That was something that I think will happen, um, isn't happening as fast as I had hoped and thought it was. Um, and it's actually, and so I asked myself why. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not because the computers can't do it. Actually, the computers can do it. We have plenty of computational power. And certainly with the power of the cloud and massive sort of warehouse style computing, we have plenty of, of power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially with like Amazon and things like that, plenty of power. Yeah. The problems actually, it's the thing that is most frustrating for me is that it's not a technological problem, it's a business problem and a legal problem. Mm -hmm. So the reason why you can't let a computer watch this movie and tell you everything that's going on in this movie is who owns that information, Yeah. right? Is it the person who made it? Is it the person who's having doing the watching? They're very serious and the, and the answer is we don't know. You can actually watch a lot of what's going on in the US, what's going on in the EU, what's going on um, in Japan. There's a lot of sort of lawsuits and things going on around who owns the derivative of that. Um, so very quickly you get into the nuts and bolts and the pragmatic part of why it hasn't mm -hmm. happened and why it has. And then it, for me, it's for me, I find it even more interesting. So I'm like, ooh, wow, we got something wrong. Now there's more data, more people to go look for. So no, I very much embrace the, the flaws more than I embrace being right. I, being right doesn't matter to me. It's actually, That's awesome. it's getting it right that is the most important, not being right. This is what I tell my team. Our goal isn't to be right so we can go, yeah, we got that thing right. That doesn't matter. The goal is not to be right, but it's to get it right, to actually build the technology that actually makes people's lives better. Yeah, and, and we all learn actually from the mistakes and almost nothing from our successes. So right. it's very valuable. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the difference between futurism and future casting? Yeah, I think futurism, they're actually very, they're very similar. Fut you know, futurism is a, is a category. Some people like it, some people don't like it. It's just a way, you know, for me, it's kind of starting with Tufti, right? Aside when futurism was an art movement, right, back in the early 20th century. But it's very much a, a way of just thinking about the future, right? There's a, a long, I think, great history of futurists. Um, a lot of people in Europe call it futurology, which I quite like, futurology. Um, and, you know, it comes from Toffler, who is sort of the one who kind of made it 
very, very popular, right? One of the jokes in some of the futurists that I've talked to is you couldn't go to a yard sale or, or a, a rummage bin sale in the 1980s or the 1970s without finding a copy of Alvin Toffler's Future Shock everywhere, right? So Toffler was this person who said, you know, no, we need to think about the future because it's important for what's happening today. And that, that, that has been going on for quite some time and businesses mm -hmm. uses it and governments use it. Future casting is very, very specific. And I think what future casting gets into is very much the sort of pragmatism side of, of what I do, where it's saying that for myself, as I take the social science and the computer science and the statistical data and the interviews and even the science fiction and say, this is what I think the future is going to be, it embraces something that I think a lot of, or some futurists and some futurism and even some forecasters don't. I tell people two things about these models, right? I say, based upon all of this research, this model at this moment in time is 100% correct. The other thing that I know with 100% certainty is it will change, <laughs> it, right? It embraces the uncertainty to say, no, the future is far too complex to say, no, this is the thing that's actually going to happen. And futurism is much more about a process that says, we take these inputs, identify these disparate inputs, mm -hmm put them into this sort of synthesis to build these models, but we embrace the fact that these models will change. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's this relentless year after year. I was speaking with a student once who I was talking about the process of future casting and she said to me, she said, well, how often do you do this process? And I could tell that even how she had sort of phrased the question that she thought it was like a yearly thing that sort of Intel did it. And I said, well, every quarter, every three months. And she goes, oh my goodness, yeah, I thought you would do it every year. And I didn't have the heart to tell her that we do it every day. That is, this is a, this future casting process is you sort of create these models and now we've had these models for 10 years and they continue to kind of move forward. Mm -hmm. And so we embrace the fact that they will continue to change. And then what you do is you don't remain content with that model. You then do back casting. So you do the future casting to create the model, and then you do the back casting where you say, okay, this is what we think it's going to be like. Then we turn around and look backwards to say, if this is where we are today, and this is where we want to go and where we think it'll go, what are the steps that we need to take? And also, what are the flags that we need to set so that we know we're either moving in the right direction or the wrong direction? So let me stop you right here and ask you this. Say your model is actually correct and it works and you sort of uh, have a, a good vision of the future, but... Is that the future that we really want? I mean, there is a difference between the future that you see as most likely uh, coming to be and the future that you want more than anything for it to be. So there's that dichotomy. And, and so uh, is, ba is it basically the goal to, to give people what they want or, or is it you know, much more than that? So for example, um, uh, Henry Ford, said once that if people had asked me what kind of product they wanted me to give them, they would have said uh, a faster horse, right? Correct. Uh, yeah, Steve Jobs was famous for never doing surveys and product surveys and things like that, right? So isn't it sort of about envisioning the future and create, the best way to predict the future is cr by creating it in a way? So it's not, on, it's not about trend identification and sort of looking where things are going, but it's a way, in a way, kind of, kind of like making things happen, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, and, or is and, it both? Well, I think it's a mix. I mean, I love that you brought up Alan Kay. So Alan Kay is a, is a huge hero of mine, and he's the one to say the best way to, to predict the future is to invent it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's right. And again, Alan is, a, is an engineer, right? So this is very much that sort of future casting engineering mindset that we build the future. I think this is one of the things at Intel, which I, where I feel such an incredible sense of personal responsibility as Intel's futurist to say, I realize that working as a futurist at Intel means that we are going to build these platforms and they are going to have an effect on people's lives. And to do that, we better get it right. right? Mm -hmm. And so how, part of the reason, part of the way that we do that is we don't ask people. So that's why I remember in that, that curve that I told you about future casting is we only do a little bit where we actually go and talk to the public, and that's usually we use um, science fiction to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Science fiction gives us a language to talk about the future. Because um, you're right, if you go to somebody and say, what do you want in the future? What most people tell you is, I really want you know, a robot that'll clean my house, right? I really, they want stuff that just makes their lives better. Flying so, cars and jetpacks. Exactly. And <laughs> so 
what I've used as my inputs are actually scientists, right? So I use social scientists who are trained to go out and understand human behavior and use that as a base. It's not what people want or what they don't want. This is what people are doing. This is what's happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the computer science and the technology, right? This is, these are scientists and engineers who are just building. They, it's not, not what they want or what they don't want. It's more, these are the capabilities. The statistical data, numbers are just the numbers. And I'm not a big trends person. Actually, as a futurist, trends to me, they're interesting, but they're trends and trends change. And you have, you know, catastrophes and, and, and black swans and all these different things. Yeah. They're good to know and they're very important. But for me, they're not the be all end all. For me, it's more important to understand what people want and to understand where the capabilities of technology are going. Because mm -hmm. these are the two things that are actually going to shape it far more than the sort of trends and all that type of stuff. I mean, granted, we're going to have GDP changes and we're going to have population changes and those are important, but I don't get too sort of granular. And then the, again, in talking to the people, and this is the one to me that is actually the most valuable mm -hmm. because well, from what you were saying, there's not just one future. I think this is what you were getting to, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite quotes by you know, William Gibson, the, the great um, science fiction author, a Canadian, by the way, yeah. um, who said, you know, the future is here, it's just poorly distributed. You know, the idea that we're not talking about one future, we're talking about multiple futures depending upon where you live and who you are and, mm -hmm. and sort of where you come from. And part of what we try to do is comprehend that, right? Because in the future casting work is to create a platform and a capability so that it can feed into all of those different futures. But you're right, I think we need to own the fact that we build the future. The future does not happen by itself. The future is created every day by the actions of people. Mm -hmm. And so you're right, we need to ask ourselves, what is the future we want? And that's so much of my work is actually going out and saying to people, this is where I see things going. What do you think? Is that the future you want? Is that the future you don't want? Now, sometimes we do that with academia, with militaries, with governments, with customers with high-tech people, but also this tomorrow project that we do is very specifically designed for the past three years to have this conversation with the public, mm -hmm. to actually go out and talk to people who are interested in this and say, here's a, here's a fact-based, science-based conversation or a fact-based, science-based, science fiction story. What do you think? Do, do you like this future? Does this future freak you out? And to really dig into it. And, and that's very important to me. And it's actually very important to um, to Intel. This is why they, the, the, the Tomorrow Project, that's our goal. It's not a money-making venture. We don't own any of the content. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that we just get out there and talk to people about it. And it's something that we have a deep commitment to. That's why we're doing it in the U.S., we're doing it in the U.K. We're going to be announcing the fact that we're going to be doing it in Brazil in 2013 wow. to get multiple, right? The future involves everybody all over the world. Yeah, so because you sure we're, we're getting those visions. Yeah. So I think you're right. Part of it is comprehending the fact that there are multiple futures, that like it or not, we are all going to build the future in one way or another. And that's just, I think, the pragmatic engineer side in me is to say, okay, people, let's, let's get on the pony. Let's go. Let's, let's figure out what we need to build. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, and, and, you know, the way we perceive the future is, of course, always culturally biased in one way or another. So it's very useful to go in different places across the globe and you know, take it from the eastern point of view, the western, the, the north and the south, sort of get the, the, the female point of view and, and all those views so that, you know, we have, you know, the, the multicolored, uh, diverse points of view. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll, wait, I'll tell you, Nicola, really quickly. So I was on a trip last year doing one of these. My, my, the folks in my lab call it future hunting. And now that once I have these models, Brian's out future hunting again, sort of going all over the world. And, and really, it's so important to me because you have to go. You have to do it. You have to. So I went from one trip where I was in the back control room on location of a Bollywood musical comedy um, shoot, which had 24 <laughs> cameras and it was in the production district of Mumbai back among all the cables, talking to the director and the producer and how they were using technology. And I actually asked him, I said, what is the future of technology? And I had my translator there because I, I, I don't speak Hindi. And I said, what is the future of technology? And before the, the guy could translate, the guy just did this, the future of entertainment. He just did this. He picked up his cell phone and his cell phone was nicer than my cell phone, which was great, right? To say he thought that what the future about technology was all these different things. So I went from that to a 3 a.m. flight to Stockholm, Sweden, 
where I was then in Stockholm, Sweden, in the basement of um, SVT, which is the um, large public broadcaster in Stockholm, Sweden, mm -hmm. in the basement where the head of IT was showing me how they had digitized every television show ever produced in Stockholm, and it lived on a five petabyte server in the basement. Wow. And that was just, to me, this huge just differentiation to show this is the future, and the future is happening. It's very high tech, but it looks very different depending upon where you are. Yeah, so I think it's incredibly important, important just to get out there and to see it. Yeah. And, and so just perhaps uh, the last sentence, if you can give a, an overview of the sort of uh, uh, the, the future now, the, the, the Tomorrow Now project. Oh, yeah, the Tomorrow Project. So the Tomorrow Project, yeah. Sorry. The Tomorrow Project is the public side of what I do. It looks to have conversations about the future, science-based, fact-based conversations. So we'll talk to scientists and, and superstars and science fiction authors, anybody. We have these conversations, and some of them will be uh, videos. Some of them will be podcasts. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be written essays. Mm -hmm. Some of them will even be science fiction stories. Mm -hmm. And some of them are science fiction stories by best-selling authors like Cory Doctorow yeah. or folks like that. But then also some of them, we actually put out calls for people all over the world to write science fiction. We're doing one right now in the UK. If you just search Tomorrow Project UK, it'll come up um, where we're having people. And people, have, I think we've gotten over 200 science fiction stories based upon science fact. And the whole point of it is to get people involved, to get people talking about the future. And at, later this month, we're actually going to be announcing the Tomorrow Project USA, so, so stay tuned. That's fantastic. So perhaps now is the time to move on to the, um, the, the role that science fiction can play uh, in the work that you do. And uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about what do you mean when you say science fiction prototyping? So science fiction prototyping is something that I've been doing for, for quite some time now. So I'm a, a science fiction author as well, and I had always used science fiction as a way to kind of think about the technologies I was working with, right? I'm a, I'm a geek, so I, I love kind of getting into it. And then I realized when we were doing it that what was happening is I was understanding the human impact. I was understanding the legal impact, the ethical mm -hmm. impact of these. And that's, I think, what really good science fiction does. It tells a good story. You know, you got to have car chases and you got to have things blow up and things go wrong. <laughs> but it also examines the human impact of it. And I had written a book called Fake Plastic Love, which I was touring with the idea. It was about robotics. And I was trying to figure out how to jump the uncanny valley, how sort of the uh, Morrison's idea of as um, robots start to look more and more human, our acceptance goes up and up and up and then you reach a point where it, it drops down and we don't like it anymore and it freaks us out and then it goes back up and this is the uncanny valley. And my idea was, well, what if we made the robots look like celebrities? Because people don't think of celebrities as actual people. They actually think of them as something other. So could we have it be celebrities? And so I was just kind of playing around with, with this idea and I um, was at a kind of, uh, conference actually in Ulm, Germany. And these roboticists sat down and said, we love your book. I said, oh, well, thank you very much. And that's very nice. And they said, no, no, no. We really like what you did there. We actually are trying to think about should we build uh, a robot that looks like celebrities? And we really liked how you were playing this out. Can we work with you? Because we have some ideas. We're actually creating robots that have both irrational and rational decisions. I said, what? Wait, wait, wow. wait. You're, you're making robots, to, you're designing your robots to make irrational decisions. And they said, yeah. I said, okay, sign me up. So we started, <laughs> started doing this, this five-year kind of collaboration with these scientists that are all over the world, using science fiction as a way to prototype their ideas. And then they would bring the ideas back to the lab, give it to the researchers, and then they would work. So it was this using science fiction as a language to talk about the human impact, but also be very pragmatic. And then from that, a um, uh, very nice science fiction, I mean, a very nice science publisher, Morgan and Claypool, came and said they had gotten a request that people were, wanted to teach it. And so I wrote a textbook called Science Fiction Prototyping, Designing the Future with Science Fiction. And uh, now that, that textbook, now that it's been written, is very, again, very pragmatic. It used to be called Science Fiction for Scientists. It was very much getting people to write science fiction to design a better future. And it's, since then, it's been amazing. It's been used for not only engineers and media theorists and the future of security, but it's being used to look at the future of 
Using science fiction to think about the future of business and business models, that just sort of floored me. I said, well, you're actually using science fiction as a development tool for future business. And they said, yeah. I said, is that a good idea? I said, <laughs> you know, there's many times in my life when I sort of say, is, are we sure we should be doing this? And they said, Brian, what's a business model? A business model is just the work of science fiction. It's just sort of thinking about the business implications into the future. So there's been all these sort of lovely um, sort of knock-on events that sort of come from some science fiction prototyping. But the real, the real nuts and bolts of it is using science fiction as a development tool to envision the future a little bit further out so that we can go and build it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, Brian, um, we've talked a lot about the present, and I want to move on to talk about the future, but I want to go through the past in order to do that. So, you're anyone who's stuck with us for the past 20 minutes or so already knows that you're a total geek. <laughs> uh, and you're proud of it. And that's why you're on the show, because both me and all my viewers and listeners are geeks, too. So, they, I'm sure they love it as much as I do, but... Why, why be so inspired with science fiction and futurism and technology? And how did you end up being such? Well, I think I was really raised to be a futurist. I think I was really born into this. My, my uh, father was a radar tracking technician and my mother was an IT specialist. So I always grew up around technology and sort of surrounded by this stuff. But it, there was a little bit of a difference there where... Um, there's this story that I have with my, my father. My father used to bring home the schematics from the radar and he would hold up the schematics and he would tell me the story about how the radar works so that again, because I was very young, he would sort of tell me, okay, here's how it flew and the, the electrical diagrams. And then the next week he would bring home that part from the radar and I realized only later on that he was doing this on purpose to sort of get my mind to think very visually but also very narratively about how technology works. So that even today when I think about software stacks or I think about system architectures, to me it's always a story. And to me there's never been any line between understanding how to do a complex system architecture and telling a science fiction story because they're all very similar. I mean, even the thing for me and that an algorithm, right? The thing that we use to process data, that the very one of the base level functions of all computers, to me it's just a science fiction story. It's a it's a it's a step by step um, sort of story and recipe. And it's really a science fiction story because you have this end that you want to get to and you're using this to get to it. So for me, that the idea of narrative has always worked um, and there's never been a line between sort of creative and science or engineering and design. To me, it's, it's always been the same thing. But then didn't you feel a little torn uh, when you were doing your uh, schooling uh, to do, for example, writing and science fiction writing in particular? Uh, creative writing of some sort rather than engineering? Well, what was fun for me is, so I went to the New School for Social Research and I feel very fortunate being able to go to the New School because at the time the New School allowed you to take classes anywhere. So before I had gone um, there, I'd been, I'd been working in universities and working in, in colleges since I was 10. So I'd been taking and, and, and learning programming, my, my first job was in a the, the computer the college computer lab. I was a ten year old teaching people how to use mainframe computers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's why I have <laughs> hair as well. It was a long long time ago. Literally the the printer that we had was in a soundproof box in a room by itself. It was, that's how long ago it was. And so I'd been studying engineering and, and, and sort of learning all of that and learning programming. And I, I wanted to do something different. So I wanted to so I went to New York City. Went to the New School for Social Research. And in the new school, you were allowed to take classes anywhere inside the new school. And the new school is a really interesting setup where it has um, an economic school, it has a design school, it has a fashion school, it has a, had a film school, it had all these different schools. And then you could also audit and go to classes at NYU and also Columbia University. So for me, and I didn't realize at the time that it was the perfect training to become a futurist. Because nobody taught futurism at that time and it really wasn't out there. Actually, Toffler taught futurism at the New School. It was the first place that he ever taught it, but by that time he had, he had left. Mm -hmm. But it allowed me to take these disparate parts. So just like in the future casting process of social science, computer science, statistical data, I was literally taking classes in all of these different things. And they would support me being able to say, well, I want to go and do 
um, a little bit of research in this other area. Or I want to go do this. So they allowed me to kind of do anything I wanted. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, I felt incredibly fortunate because it was one of the, one of the, the great decisions I think of my life because it allowed me to bring all of this in, right? Going from Marxist economics to, <laughs> you know, to, you know, science fiction films of the 1970s, then walking down the hall and studying Jane Austen. And then, you know, those sorts of things allowed, I think, to create a very different skill set. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. So, so uh, perhaps it's nice to make it a little bit more explicit. What do you feel is the motivation and the ultimate goal behind your work and what you do in general? Well, that changed, Nicola. That actually, it, it changed really big for me um, in 2010. So before, and I would say all the way up until then, it was all about building. I defined myself by what I built. Right. Mm -hmm. it, that, that's the and 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 I think you can see that actually if you even look at some of my writings and the things that I've done, that's is, this is always why I write. Right. Everything that you could puts down because you're defined by your output. You're defined by the products that you build. You're defined by the books that you write because these are the things you can actually point to them. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a driving force for me. And I wanted to do the best I could, right? The best books I could, come up with the best products I could, the most successful products. Mm -hmm. And then even in coming to Intel, that was really the drive because there was a lot of work sort of changing how Intel designed chips. It was not, it was not easy. Let me tell you, getting, getting an engineering team to actually understand experience and use science fiction and all of that, it, it was a lot of work. Now we, we get along great, but it, it took some doing. But I think in 2010, when, when, when Intel made me its futurist and started going out and talking to people, I got to see the effect. Um, and then it became not about the products that we built, but the effect that those products have. Um, and, it, and it goes back to that, that sense of, of responsibility that I felt that I really saw now that I'd been traveling the world for quite some time. And for most of my career, I had traveled. But as, an, as Intel's futurist, starting talking to people, you began to see that the products that we were making, the visions that we were coming up with, were changing the future. Literally, these products were actually coming out. And when you do it on a global scale, like we were at Intel, you realized it wasn't just Intel, though, right? It wasn't just me as Intel's futurist, that myself working with other people in other countries, in other businesses, we were the ones who were actually doing it in a way that was so deep and profound to me to realize, no, it's it's us, especially if this is, if you're all geeks, it's all of us. Like, no, it's, and, and you can't, you can't punt. This is not something that you can go, oh, well, it's going to happen. The future is made by those people over there because it's not. And that was a profound thing to realize that, no, the future was going to be built by us and we were actually doing it. And that is still the driving force to me. This is why I spend the majority of my life on the road, why I spend so much of my time talking, why I try to write constantly, is to get people involved, to get people to become active participants, because that's the only way that we're going to do it. That's the only way that we're going to say, this is the future that we want, and this is the future that we don't want, and we have to do it. And, it's, and, and to me, it's so simple that it became so clear that we were the ones who were, that were going to do it, that you couldn't look to somebody else to do it. So is that what you see as the responsibility of Brian David Johnson? And, and is there more to it? Uh, and, and then the next level, of course, is, so what is the responsibility of Brian David Johnson is one part of the question, but then the next one is like, what, do, what is the responsibility of Intel? And, and then, of course, a step even higher is, what is the responsibility of all of us there watching you right now? Well, for everybody who's watching us, is to become an active participant in the future. Get out there and own the fact that you are going to build the future. How much you build the future is up to you. Now, again, you could build a little bit. Again, anybody, anybody who has a family is building the future. Anybody who is a teacher is building the future. Anybody who's a geek and is working in technology is building the future. And it is up to you to gauge how much you want to do. And that's a personal decision. It is a completely personal decision. Everybody doesn't have to be a crazy futurist that flies all over the world to sort of has this passion about the future. But we all need to own that, right? And, and especially if you have a family and especially in your community, you need to understand that it starts with yourself and with your family, with your social network and with your community. So I think that is all of our responsibility is to figure out, number one, that we build the future. And then number two is how do we make the lives of people better? Because I think ultimately that should be our goal. Everybody, how do we make the lives of people better 
by this future that we're building. And I believe that's, that's when you go to Intel, that level and sort of the level of sort of people who, and businesses and governments who are building the future, ultimately that should be your goal. Because if you keep that as your goal, you'll be okay. Because if you're really meaningfully trying to make the lives of people better, you'll do good business, you'll do great code, you'll make great things. But by touching people's lives and by touching people's lives in ways that you'll never understand, that I think is a very big deal. And it's one of the things that drives Intel. It's one of the things that our CEO, Paul Ottolini, says all the time is that it's one of our goals is to touch the lives of every human being on the planet by what we do. And we always say it's to touch the lives of every human being on the planet and make that life better. And I think if we can, if we can hold that goal up, and it's hard, but we need to do it. And then I think ultimately for me, as Brian David Johnson, is I am such a geek and I am so passionate is that for right now, again, I, I think it changes, right? As I said before, it was about building things and making sure that I'm building the best things that I can. And now it's about comprehending that we are building the future. And so for me, everything that I do and everything that I will do in the future is getting out there and talking to people about that. And making sure that for myself as a principal engineer and as a designer, that I'm holding myself to that higher bar that I think everybody else should be held to. And to make sure that we're doing it. And again, this is the, the pragmatic side. It's not just having a vision for the future, but it's then doing something about it. Whether you do something about it on a personal level, if you do something about it on a community level, or you do something about it on a global level. And for me personally, it's having this vision for the future, getting out there, talking to people all over the world, making sure that I'm talking to everybody almost on every continent of the world so that I'm getting an understanding of what is the future that they want and that I'm doing everything I can to make sure that we're building that, not only inside of Intel, but all over the world. That's, that's fantastic, Ryan. So, so let me see if, uh, if we can put the mirror in front of you right now. Uh, would you say that uh, you are an engineer a futurist, a science fiction writer, a geek, a painter, an artist? I'm a geek. I think I'm a geek, first and foremost. <laughs> um, and, and how I define geek is passion. Right? You can be a food geek, you can be a music geek, you can geek out. Everything that I do is ultimately because I'm passionate about it and I'm interested in it. There's one of the things that, um, one of the best bits of advice I ever got, and this was actually from my wife many, many years ago. She said, you always have to be curious. Everything, you know, if you can always default to being curious, if you can, even if you're in a situation where you meet somebody that you don't like, or you're in some situation where you don't want to be there and you really are uncomfortable, if you still are curious about it, you ask yourself, well, why? Why don't I like this person? Or, or why, am I, why don't I like this? I think if you can always be curious, and to me that's at the, the heart of being a geek and also the heart of being an engineer, right? And of all these different things is to actually say, you know, have that constant search because then there's always something new and you're always sort of diving into those things. So I think, I think being a geek is sort of the thing that I treasure. <laughs> that's fantastic. Now let me ask you this question. One of my best friends is, is an engineer. He works for, um, I think it's Philips, and they do, um, he does maintenance on all the MRI and scanning equipment for in all the major hospitals here in Toronto and in Ontario. And we always have this sort of uh, nice debate between the two of us because my undergraduate degree is in philosophy and he has this thing about, you know, philosophers are people who bullshit for a living, you know? <laughs> When you have an engineer, you know, here's my work, here's what I did, you know, as you said before, output. Touch it, feel it, it's here, right? What do you do? You can't show me what you do, you bullshit all day long. And then, that's it, in his opinion. So, so what, in your opinion, is the importance of philosophy, and especially I have a sort of a very ethical slant uh, on yeah. futurism? Well, I think it's, it's, it's pretty big and it's only going to get bigger. <clears throat> and I think the reason is, especially with the, the march of technology kind of moving forward, one of the things that we see around the year 2020 is that the size of meaningful computational power is approaching zero, right? So that means that, you know, 17 nanometers, 
14 nanometers, seven nanometers, getting really, really small. And, and simply what that means is we can turn anything into a computer. So if we can turn anything into a computer, we no longer have to ask ourselves, can we turn this into a computer? We have to ask ourselves, what do we want it to do? So if you can turn this water glass into a computer, this shirt into a computer, we have to ask ourselves, what? Right? What do we want to do? And then plus, when we have all this big data out there, all this massive amount of information, we also have to ask ourselves, what? What do we want it to do? How will it make our lives better? And why? Right. Now, this is where the, the philosophers come in. This is a very big deal because I think what you tell your friend is that what you are coming up with is a higher level requirement set. Because what is starting to happen is that with all of these devices, the I.O., sort of the input-output, it used to just be a keyboard or then it was touch and sometimes it's voice. As you as we begin to live in a world where we're surrounded by computational intelligence, we're literally living inside a computer, the I.O. is going to be a relationship. You will have a relationship with all of your technology. It will need to understand what it needs to be human. And that's what a lot of the programmers are doing now, especially if you looked at a very basic challenge, like the Netflix challenge that's happened a few years ago, I wrote about a lot. The way that they won, the team that won, was not just using math, not just using statistics. They had to understand humans and what humans are doing because humans and the science of humans and the art of understanding humans actually fed into that spec and allowed them to win the Netflix challenge because they understood very subtle things that if you rated a movie, let's say you were rating two movies, if you liked the first movie, you would rate the second movie higher. If you didn't like the first movie, that same movie that you would have rated higher before, you rate lower. Mm -hmm. So understanding the subtleties of humans, understanding the subtleties of the human heart, understanding the subtleties of, of ethics and, and of people in different countries is going to be extremely important for us to create more robust requirement sets to then turn into that relationship we have with our technology. Mm -hmm. Well, let me talk a little bit about those subtleties here and, and the fact that um, it may, may sound a little bit like an off-topic question, but I think it can shed some light here and about the fact that the computer universe that's growing exponentially, the one that we're living in, is, is pretty much a binary universe. It's a universe of ones and zeros. It's a universe of either or. It's a universe of more or less black or white. The human universe is much more subtle universe. In a way, it's much more quantum mechanical. It's both one and zero. It's both mm -hmm. black and white. So is there any danger or what's the danger of moving from, you know, a, a sort of like the human analog universe into the digital universe of ones and zeros of sort of uh, losing that infinite resolution that we have both zooming in and zooming out in the analog universe and all those infinite subtleties and the depth? Well, I think what happens is as we begin to develop these technologies, if we understand what we're developing for. So before we were developing for command and control. We were developing for tasks, right? We want this robot arm to go pick this thing up and move it over here, right? We were so much of engineering, so much of technology was actually a task based. It was command and control. I ask you to do something, the computer does something for me. Mm -hmm. I have to ask the computer in a very specific way. I have to use this keyboard, I have to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And that I think gave people this notion that technology was very rigid, right? And that's simply because technology up until now or up until recently couldn't do it. It didn't have the capabilities, didn't have the computational power. We didn't have the higher level thinking around engineering to understand how to, to figure that out. But I think it's actually changing. Um, and it's really, it's subtle right now and it's starting to. And I think as we move towards 2020, it's going to become more. I actually don't think that technology is binary. I think at its base, certainly the, 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 com the, 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 the base set is binary, but you can also argue that the base set of human life is the, is the four strands of, of DNA. It's kind of the same thing. I actually think is it, it's a design problem, is that if we begin to understand what it needs to be human, if we begin to understand that human beings are different depending upon who they're talking to and where they are, if we begin to understand the subtleties, again, of the human heart and the human mind, 
we can begin to design for those things. Because ultimately, technology is just a tool. Mm -hmm. Technology is there to make our lives better, to allow people to communicate, to give us the science fiction that we love, to do all of that. So I actually think if technology is designed correctly, it actually amplifies that world that you were talking about. It amplifies that human world. And that, I think, is actually the goal, is what we can get to. I think don't actually think we should think of technology as being something separate from us, being something that's non-human, because it's a product of humanity. Mm -hmm. It's a product of us. And it's really, what do we want to do with it, is the question that we need to ask ourselves. And then strive for that. Set the bar very high. Mm -hmm. Brian, I know your time is very valuable, so I'm going to try to wrap it up in the next three or four minutes, if we can. I have three questions left that I really want to ask you. Very okay, quickly. I'll, keep, I'll keep it short. I'll keep my answer short. Um, okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, where can people go and find out more about you and your work? Well, mainly, I think that the best you can just, you know, search, you know, you can Google me. Or you can also go to The Tomorrow Project. You can just Google The Tomorrow Project at The Tomorrow Project UK. And that's pretty much where we try to put everything together. And there's usually links on there to find some of the speaking and the writing that I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the last two questions. Uh, the title of my show is called Singularity One-on-One, -on -One, so I'd be remiss if I don't ask you, what's your take on the technological singularity? How likely I, is it to happen? How do you, do you use it at all somewhere within the sort of planning for the future at Intel or at the work you do? I love the idea of the technological singularity. I mean, for me, it has... Um, really, really interesting knock-on implications. And I actually, I know Werner Vinge quite well, and we have these conversations about it. And, and, and for me, I think what I love about the singularity is it's not just one singularity, right? How it will happen, how it might happen, has it already happened, all these sorts of things I think are fascinating. Mm -hmm. For me, it doesn't really fall in my field of view, right? I look 10 to 15 years out, and everything that we know right now is it still sort of lies on the other side of that. So in my pragmatic day work, it hasn't blipped up onto the horizon. It's not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I certainly track, certainly think about. I think the implications of it are, are fascinating. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can keep the right of getting you for an interview at about 2020 when the next 10 years, you that should possibly fall within yeah. your horizon. Well, it starts to come up on the horizon. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and then the very last question that I always ask of my guests is, if people were to take a single message from this interview with you today, what would you like that to be? If I could have anybody take anything away from our conversation today, it would be to own the fact that everybody needs to be an active participant in the future. Do not let the future happen to you. Do not sit back and be a passive person that lets the future just happen. The future is made every day by the actions of people and human beings build the future and build technology and we have to own that and then make a personal decision about what you want to do about it. Because you have to. You, you will build the future. Whoever you are, you will build the future. And because of that fact, intellectually, you have to make a decision about what you are going to do. That's a fantastic way to end our interview, Brian. And here's where your optimism com comes in. And this is just one other topic in addition to the picture behind you that I didn't have the chance to talk about this time. But perhaps I'll give it another six, time, uh, six months and I'll, I'll ask for, for another interview because I feel I can talk to you for, forever. Uh, Brian David Johnson. Thank you very much for taking time to be with us today. Nicola, it was a pleasure and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks.